Okay, thank you, Kripa. Um, it's a complex topic, uh, the misappropriation of gender in Indian cinema. But just in three or four phases that it went through, um, while the idea of women in Indian cinema was initially the idea of, uh, of, of a woman being the server, being the nurturer, but the nurturer was not uh, created in the way that you would expect that the larger, more powerful idea of the nurture is. But it is more servitude. So if you looked at Indian cinema at that time when it first grew, it was always the wife in servitude and the wife touching the feet of the husband. And the wife was always weak and crying and giving and, and did not have much power. But it was strange that around the time that this was happening, there was a woman that became very, very popular amongst what we call the mass cinema. Uh, and she was called Fearless Nadia. She did completely the opposite. She used to come, and this was in the 1940s, just before independence, and then continued into the early 50s. She used to come in a mask and shorts, and on a horse, and a whip. And she was called the lady with the whip. And she would beat up the villains, she would take on men, she would do stunts. She would actually on the film do her own stunts and compete with other men on, on stunts. And so with this rather, uh, this woman that came in shorts and with a mask like the Lone Ranger and was hugely popular and, and, and the people used to applaud her. The strange thing, and you don't know, I don't know whether that was a portion of success that she was not Indian. She was an Australian woman who had blue eyes, but in black and white era, you couldn't tell. And uh, she came to India and somebody gave her the name Fearless Nadia. And she was known as Fearless Nadia and did a number of very, very successful films. I think she went the other way also. And she also tried to play at some time the, the wife that was pleading and weak and, and uh, in servitude. I, I use the word servitude because that's the fundamental impression that came that the more in servitude the woman was, the more powerful the man was. And from the old traditions of India where the woman actually gave the man power with power had gone away. Um, so that's what started. She contradicted it. So the, the, the contradictions were always omnipresent within the Indian audiences. However, I think that the last part of what we did in the media in films is we created these, these ideas and, and, and we usurped it. It wasn't that we always said that we are following what the masses want and what they believe in. I don't think that was always right. I, I think that, that cinema actually creates its own social norms. It creates its own audiences. And then you audiences come and come here. And that went on for so long. It went on for so long. And just to tell you how long it went, only about a couple of de decades ago, um, there was, um, you know, if you asked, if you saw an interview of a young actress and said, uh, and talk about her role, and here's what she would all of them say. She said, well, in the first half, I'm kind of tomboyish. I wear shorts. And that's the second half. I realized that I'm actually a woman, I wear saris and I become koi. And that's my character. So what were we teaching by that? That, you know, a free spirit cannot be a free spirit. A free spirit has to be contained. And if it gets contained, it is to be applauded. So why should the free, free spirit of a woman be contained and be applauded was a gender created, created by women. Also remember that if you go back to an Indian cinema and those that remember its history and know of very, very famous, very good actors, you know, like Helen, um, there was always this differentiation between the heroine and the vamp. The vamp was the one that actually did all the bad deeds and who was actually stronger than the heroine always, the leading lady. She was stronger, but she was bad. She was a bit evil. And the heroine was angelic and and God-fearing and, and, and in servitude to her husband all the time. And uh, then as fashion changed, the heroine and the vamp became the same person. 
and then Indian cinema became a little complicated, but never actually broke through this idea of the gender of weakness and 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 uh, and, and giving it. It was always ultimately the so-called hero and vamp, stroke vamp, because it became the same. So if you if you go to you know, modern people like Priyanka Chopra, there was a time when the heroine would not be able to show more than an ankle and the vamp would come out in swimming costumes. Yet now the heroine will come out in swimming costumes. So they broke through that, yet they didn't change. They did not change. She never ended up in a swimsuit. She always ended up in a sari and she always ended up in the same idea of having a status, not if not lower than certainly in servitude to the goals and the ambitions of the man. Um, it's being changed now a lot and it's being changed by television. Uh, I remember many, many years ago, I did, I personally was acting in a, in a series called Ran, and it was, it actually changed the gender. It was the story uh, following the true story of India's first woman DIG and it was made by her sister. And I still come across women now that said, we saw that program, we showed our parents that program and uh, be convinced and were charged and create and inside us it created an ambition to achieve our own dreams so they became pilots and and uh, you know even in, in in the government like smriti irani i met the other day she said that she would not have done any of that had that program not come out and she had not been so moved or to so affected by that program so i'm saying that that while there was going on on television there was something, not the Sasbi Kabi Bahuti kind of series, but there were other series that were coming out. And I say this to say that audiences have all been ready for that. Audiences, we, we keep blaming the audiences that the audiences want this, therefore we give this. No, we have been feeding audiences probably because we have our own misog misogyny in our own selves that we portray and, and Indian cinema became like that. It's still like that. It still has that, unfortunately, but some films have changed. And, and uh, you mentioned Bandit Queen. Um, Bandit Queen is a hard film to watch. It is hard because sometimes a filmmaker actually targets himself or herself. And it is in the, in the uh, discovery of Poulin Devi's plight that I started to, to analyze my own self. I came up as a you know a young Punjabi boy told that I own the universe and certainly as far as women are concerned I'm more dominant and and we were all fed with very false sense of masculinity and that false of self of masculinity you not only see if I may say say so in in the amount of rapes that happen uh, in India not just in the elsewhere but if you just walk the streets of Delhi at night a girl, young girl walks the streets of Delhi at night you can see that this, this, uh, that uh, men, young men have, they, it, it's kind of, they, uh, they feed their own self-worth by being rude and teasing women. So when I did Bandit Queen, I had to think a lot about this idea of rape. And, and I, I, what I tried to portray was that rape was not a, a, an act of sexuality. And as long as it's an act of sexuality, there will always be a morality behind it. It's not a moral issue. It's a political issue. It is, uh, rape is an act of oppression, not just political oppression, but it's an oppression of another gender for, and it is mostly done by men who lack their own sense of self-worth. Um, I discovered that a very large part of our masculine and false sense of masculinity of ourselves comes from a lack of self-worth. And so when you are insecure, that's, and you know, whenever somebody is insecure, you can get a sense of power by being dominant over somebody or a gender or a section of society that you perceive is weaker than yourself. And therefore, if you can do it, you will do it. And you walk away with a sense of pride in your chest, which is very false. And so when I did Bandit Queen, I was very keen, very keen to bring it out as a woman that was powerful, but men that were had the power, which was physical or political, 
but were 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 lacking completely lacking in in in, in self worth and completely lacking in a sense of of confidence in their own masculinity and if you do see Bennett you realize that there was one man that wasn't like that but of course they killed him so over time I'm hoping and now with the OTT platforms it is changing but it's not changing enough it's not changing enough because there is still a gender gap and we don't understand gender we don't understand it. And, and as long as we don't quite come to terms with the fact that there is uh, a, uh, that we are, just the word itself is a conflicting word. Gender, what do we mean by gender? And why do we keep mentioning it? We keep mentioning it because there is a gender gap. And because we do believe that men and women are born with a different sense of who they are and a different sense of what the, relationship the power dynamics is between men and women and what we actively have to work towards especially in cinema and media because it's so all pervasive right now especially with everybody sitting at, sitting at home and you know in the lockdown we noticed how much people actually watch over the ott platform stories being unfolded uh, and we need to find a way and i'm not sure what the way is we are born physically different obviously um, you know, men have, will never, never know what it is like to give birth to a child. I often talk to uh, some, you know, well, some friends when they are giving birth, and I say that is a that is something that is denied to us. And I um, and I, I I feel lesser because of that because they have the ability to create life, um, and they've been given that by God. So. Um, I'm bringing up a lot of issues right now that we can talk about, but I'm going to leave this particular thing and open it out to discussion is that I look forward to a time when gender is not an issue. It cannot be. Um, love stories you know, from, from Romeo and Juliet to now, we depend on, on a very strong division between what is the male and the female and gender, girls, boys, men, women, and not realizing that actually the male and the female exists within us. I am both masculine and feminine. Uh, all my creativity arises from the feminine in myself, I believe. I believe that the spirituality inside me arises from the feminine in myself. Uh, and there is the masculine in myself, as there is in everybody else, even in, in, in all the women that I know, the drive, the ambition, there is a masculine in them. So I think that we should understand in gender from the point of view is we are always, always ourselves, both genders. And, you know, the, the, the myths and the mythology in our religion or in any other religion we talk about, you know, Shiva and Parvati together make the universe. The creativity and the creation and destruction and the creativity of the universe arises from the confluence and conflict of gender within you, not necessarily between a man and a woman. And I think our conversation should be about uh, uh, the, the, the beauty of the, of the difference of the gender within each one of us. So I've raised a lot of ideas here. I want to hear everybody else, and then let's talk about that. Is everybody yes. still there? No, no, everybody's, everybody's here. I'm hoping that uh, uh, Sid will uh, moderate the conversation. So just uh, we normally we go on a little longer, but uh, Sid, will you uh, pick up the the moderation? Absolutely. Um, Thank you very much. Uh, you certainly raised a number of points um, and to the point. Um, so yes, let's have a uh, have our discussion with questions and comments. And I'd like to ask uh, anybody who is speaking just to tell tell us who you are. I mean, all of us know each other, uh, but our guest doesn't. So if you could just uh, say a word or two about yourself. That would be very helpful. So, who wants to begin? I see there's a chat. Oh, hello, sir. Hi. 
my name is abhijit and i am an intern with bhavani chachi i'm a punjabi as well so i completely understand when you say uh, that the popular punjabi media at least in the present i think is feeding into the entire masculinity issue what makes it scary for me is that little children with access to this kind of uh, for example they have profanity which is directed towards women in the songs and people find it to be very cool i don't think that these till these references are there in popular media in songs and in culture there could be any discernible change when we talk about gender per se so what could actors and what could uh, uh, celebrities and everybody else do to probably take this issue down and yes that's about it thank you thank you um i think that we have all have to be a little more conscious of what we do as as you know creators of media knowing the influence that we have and i'm just hoping that you know actors themselves have been doing it like you know our current big stars have done it that's how in many ways they became stars doing that and and feeding into the very things that you are finding repugnant now um and it's a, it's a very interesting question why didn't we find this repugnant 10 years ago why didn't we not find it 20 years repugnant 20 years ago so i do think that actually that's that's actually a, a good thing because society is questioning itself and it must question itself uh with uh, everything i mean terrible things like rape but it goes beyond that it beyond it goes into the way you know marriages are treated in the way that that mothers talk to their sons and then inflict in in a way inflict upon their sons what was inflicted upon them and then they talk about that and subconsciously propagate it through their sons i've seen that happen but the the point you raise is why can't media just stop doing that i think in a way um i know movements like me too and they have a lot of issues around it and the fundamental issues is why did we ever need it why did we let it go that far but there it is but it is a society in flux and our society is a society in flux and we need to change the society not just from a, a way that the media reflects the the society that we are now finding repugnant but it's got to change in our education systems we uh, we need to grow up with different values different ideas we may need to make a conscious effort all that having said i agree with you i think it is time for the media to be you know somebody was asking me i was uh, talking to an actor here where i am in london i'm working with an actor called emma thompson and she saw banner queen she hadn't seen it and she said why is it such a power how come you made such a powerful film i said it's a film in which the filmmaker attacks himself because he, because i felt that we are all responsible individually and collectively and the moment you accept that for every act perpetuated upon uh, of humiliation or power or i i don't want to keep using the word rape because then it becomes too uh too fact based or too precise because rape happens at a very very different levels you know it's not just the last act of rape and it's like it, there are so many levels that sometimes are not even physical you know and the, the the fact that we are all collectively responsible and i'm not even i'm even not even saying that it's just the male uh the you know the masculine part of society or the men and the boys that are responsible women are also responsible we all have a collective responsibility and in that collective responsibility if media is a collective viewing is a collective idea of all of us viewing media together then there's a huge social and individual responsibility on people that create the content to actually take cognizance and say we are responsible we are responsible for what is happening you can't just go make a film on rape and say oh isn't it terrible what you must do is say how how responsible were we for it we were responsible 
We are individually, collectively responsible. And the moment we start to feel that, then in that spirit, we should keep moving forward. Yeah, do you agree with me? Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Yeah. More questions? Um, Shikharji, I maybe I can quickly ask you a question. Um, I wanted to ask you if there are any formal structures to address uh, these kind of issues within the film, uh, this thing. Are there like, uh, I know you have sensor boards and things like that, but that's kind of like once the film is done, but are there like guidelines uh, for uh, uh, media? Can this be something like that can be brought up as a policy level? Are there policies that govern entertainment and can we, can we somehow work these issues into policies so that it can in, it can impact what is going on into movies because others how else would you uh, um change that and and the second thing is that i want you have a new role right now you're the president of this uh, real, uh, very prestigious film uh, institution right do you think that within within your current role you would be able to implement some of these things uh just that was just a general question yeah. that I no i agree i think it's it's very difficult to Created into policy because policy become a set of rules that you follow. And the moment in a society there's a set of rules that you have to follow, there is an automatic rebellion. Okay, how can I subvert that rule? A rule has that, that potential. You rebel against rules. Uh, so I would say that, yes, we have the sense of board, but it's always after the fact. And say, And I remember there was a time when, okay, kissing was not allowed and to say a word against a, uh, against a woman is not allowed. But it goes deeper than that. If we are to create change, we cannot just say what you can't do. We can encourage what you should do. And what you should do as against what you can't do is a big change because one is can be seen as... A, taking away of creative rights, but the other is to encourage your creative rights to think the same way. So your question is what I would like to do at the Institute I've just joined. It's, it's a, um, you know, it is ultimately governed by the government and therefore there's a fair amount of bureaucracy. My first thing to them was, is we need to give, to, to bring in more students, more young girls as students into the, into filmmaking whether it's filmmaking, directing, writing, editing, um, and br bringing them in into the film world, they're not enough women students. There's not enough women faculty. And I think that that needs to change. And that I'm hoping in itself will create change. The more women actually take responsibility in, in, in our media, the more women there are out there. Act, and uh, there are women out there a lot all over the world. Um, but they feel, and I'm going to say this with a little bit of concern that I'm saying this, is that women in charge of media worldwide um, still feel that they have to give into the power of ultimate power of, of, of a world created by men. And I think we need to take that away. This is not a world created by men. It's a world created by all of us. So going back to what I'm saying is that in the sense of what I would like to do, I would like to give more scholarships. I, I will always, I mean, they will never agree to that. I, I, I said that you should just make, you know, education for women in the film institute free. Um, just take in more women and put more women in the faculty, uh, populate it with, so that, you know, there is a better gender mix. And then there's a greater, uh, there's a greater exchange of ideas between genders and 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 uh, the exchange of ideas between gender and itself creates an understanding of each other there is also uh, remember that it is the separation of genders a lot when you're very young that you start to wonder we are being separated who am i who is she who is she who is he and between the he her she him we are making up we are creating conclusions a lot of which come from 
the inability to actually relate to each other, understand each other. And uh, to me, that's one of the things that I'd like to do with the Institute is free flow of emotion, free flow of a deeper understanding of who we are. That's what I'd like to do. Good afternoon. Bhavani, can I ask a question? Absolutely, Simona. Please introduce yourself also. I think the, the team also needs to know you. I think only Kripa and me know you. So. Um, good afternoon, um, Mr. Kapoor. It's a pleasure to listen to you. My name is Sumana Kasturi and I study gender and media as a part of my academic work. And um, obviously, I followed your career my whole life, watching all of your movies and so on. So it's a pleasure to be able to be here and ask you uh, a question. Um, I wanted to say that I, I really am really happy that you mentioned the fact that we need more women in producing media. Um, so, uh, you know, your tenure at the Institute, if it can mean that we have more women uh, producing content, then hopefully the narratives or sexist narratives might change. And also your point about toxic masculinities, you know, which is sort of uh, inbuilt into the uh, socialization that we do for our children, both for men and women, they get the same messages. But I was wondering, um, you mentioned Udan and I remember watching it. And I literally cannot watch Indian television at this point. So we started with Udan and Rajini and so many lofty uh, shows and we've come now not just to sas the sas bahu serials but also these nagin serials and i mean there's been instead of improving we've had a dramatic drop and one of the people in the forefront of this change or in the forefront of this new kind of television has been ekta kapoor so i don't mean to sort of pick on her specifically, but I'm curious to know how this shifted, this, this need to supposedly cater to the masses. Um, but I think it's just something else. And I wonder if you can, you know, throw some light on that deterioration rather than what could have been better and better television and cinema. We seem to have flipped and gone, down, gone downhill. Yeah, I don't disagree with you. I don't want to dis Ekta. She's very, very successful. Um, the question then is, is she catering to existing demand? Is that what people want? Well, if that was people wanted, why 30 years later do I still get letters on, on Uran? Why do I meet women today that have had very, very powerful, successful careers that were provoked by one television show? Why did that happen? So we're wrong. We make assumptions and we, we, uh, we just try and you know what they're not? But they say that this is what the audience wants. This is what we cater to. This is what they respond to. I should change that narrative. The narrative is that we cater to audience fears and we turn their fears into entertainment. And then we create large entertainment issues around fundamental fears. It is, of course, when you welcome another, another person into your household, um, you know, there are issues. There's, nobody says that there are not issues in relationships. There are issues in every relationship. But if you pick up that one issue and you take the very base fears, and you create entertainment out of those fears, and then that entertainment feeds those fears. So you're, it's, it's a self, it's like, you know, uh, it, it, it's self-generating, it's a self-generating dragon. So I really believe that, that you are feeding those fears and then making money on those fears, and then the fears go on. So what, what, where we are going wrong, and you ask me this, is you can barely watch the new uh, Nagin and, and, and and, and stuff that Ekta does produce, successful as she is and bright as she is, they feed, you, you just analyze them and you realize that they, their success and they are provoking fundamental fears in society. That's the issue. And therefore we are propagating fears and creating, saying it's what the kind of ent entertainment that masses want. That's the issue. 
Uh, I like yeah. your, um, there's something I have to think about. Um, turning fear into entertainment. It's a very interesting yeah. train of thought and I'll pursue it. But really, what can we do though to improve this? Again, not to pick on Ekta Kapoor. She set a model and it worked and everybody's followed it. But there's, a, there's so many people. Yeah. I, I think that um, we need to create uh, a, a, a new design and a new architecture of entertainment. That's what we need to do. And but people say, um, but you know, why should we do that? That's not our job. But we created what people watch. It's wrong. You know, when I've forever heard this that, oh man, but this is what the masses want. I've never ever met anybody who said we are the masses. Have you ever met anybody? <laughs> Nobody's ever said I'm the masses. The masses are always other people. Why is it never you? Never is. So who are these masses that we talk about? Are we talking about a mass movement? Sure. I mean, what else was Hitler but a mass movement? He created, he took the fundamental fears that lay base inside people and created a mass movement and killed millions of people. So how are we different? In a way, we are doing the same thing. We are going into the fun. So what can we do? We need to populate the content creation with people that actually have, I wouldn't say loftier. Lofty is a very, you know, it's a very so upper judgmental word. Judgmental word. Yeah, judgmental word. I would say people that have a greater understanding of humanity. And I'm just saying, human, if you have a greater understanding and a knowledge and, and, and spirituality, humanity, all of that, then you will not give in to that kind of content. You will not. You will try and make something different. And, and um, is it difficult? Well, if you ask yourself and say, I'm a creative person, you are raising your level of difficulty right up there. Because you're either a creative person from inside you. If you are a creative person from inside you, then everything that you produce is who you are. Now tell me whether how many people that create those programs will have the courage to say, yeah, I create this, this is who I am. No, you won't find that. They will not say this is who I am. They'll say, well, that's my job. And so how do you change that? How do you take creativity and shift that separation between who you are and what you do? And a hundred percent, like my exploration, that's why I come, that's how I met. Bhavani ji, that's how, why I spend time as much as I can with Amma is I'm in search of who I am and I want every bit of work that I ever do to reflect who I am. Now, the moment you put that responsibility on yourself in your creative art, things change. Right? How do we do that? I think one, we need to populate our content creators with people who are, want to explore who they are. That's all we need. Because in the exploration of who you are, there's a lot of truth. How, the, the question that we need to sit together and say is the exploration, the, the desire to explore who you are may not probably happen by forced public policy. It has to come from within. And if it has to come from within, hopefully we populate a lot of our content creators with, with you know, a mixing of genders, not dominated by the male gender and a mixing of genders. And if we keep doing that, hopefully something will change. It's a hope. I'm, uh, it's not, it will change. But what we need to do is accelerate the pace of change. So that's what we sh should be talking about. How do we accelerate that pace of change? Lots to think about and valid points. And thank you so much um, for you. taking the time to answer it so thoroughly. Thank you. Thank you. By the way, where do you follow these studies? Um, what do you mean? So you said that you are, you are, this is, you, you're following this. Do you, is, is there, a, I, is there a structure I, to that? Yeah, I mean, I have a PhD in communication that with a focus on gender. Mm -hmm. And um, I studied in the United States and in India, and then I teach. Um, and I write, I'm writing currently, working with an author on writing a book about gender and society and media. So and, and I'm, just, I'm an academic. 
Okay, and which institution did you do your PhD with? Um, I did my PhD at the University of Hyderabad, okay. the communication department. All right, okay, that's good. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Shikharji. Good morning. Um, first of all, thank you very much. It's such a privilege to be hearing you. I didn't believe that I would be actually one day be face to face with you and it's an extreme privilege. It's a celebrity moment. Thank you very much for that. Thank um, you. Shikharji, I've been following uh, uh, your work um, you know, probably after 2010 or 11. That's when I started having a, probably an opinion about uh, Indian cinema. And uh, I have been uh, very fascinated by your talk on TED, TED also, your TED talk also. Um, uh, my question is, uh, um, you know, the portrayal of women uh, in Indian cinema, I come from a time uh, probably after, uh, uh, probably Kajol was the first Indian actress that I would have an impression of uh, when it comes to Indian cinema and later on the rest. I see that, uh, you know, the weak portrayal of women probably is also linked uh, with uh, the weak portrayal of men in Indian cinema. For example, by weakness, uh, you know, a hero who smokes or drinks on screen, I would consider him to be equally weak because he's not a, a right portrayal of strength. Uh, strength would be something else. Be more pure, uh, more honest and sincere, something closer to that. Uh, so. Uh, intoxication, addiction, or abuse, or uh, any sort of, uh, you know, um, weak flirtiness and things like that. I would consider that, that as weak, that weak as well. So it's not just with the women, uh, it's the men also who are portrayed to be weak on screen characters. Now, there is a larger link with violence or portrayal of sexuality or portrayal of uh, uh, drug abuses or things like that on screen. Uh, now my question sir, to you is that uh, there must be a larger ecosystem of weakness that is probably breeding around and uh, portrayal of women uh, as weak characters on screen and television or probably or, or cinema is a reflection of that in some way. I'm not from the industry. Uh, I would like to infer on this if I'm wrong, kindly correct me. Uh, but if such is the case, then what would be a creative way to have checks on this? Uh, Bhavani Chachi mentioned policy. You know, policy is one of the tools, definitely, and probably one of the most powerful tools. Uh, but sir, because you are a creative person and uh, creative men um, have their own abstract ways of understanding or probably uh, explaining creative men is also another creative job. So are there other avenues also through which we uh, as a society can reach out. Uh, that is uh, my question and linked to this is another question which you can choose to answer or not is that we in Indian history, mythology or uh, we would call them as Puranas as scriptures do have fabulous portrayals of strong women. Why are such portrayals not uh, presented in courage? For example, Adi Shakti is the most powerful of all the Trinity of uh, gods uh, in Indian um, belief system. Now, why are such ideas not uh, taken forward? Thank you very much for hearing my question. Okay, I'll take your second question first. Yes, um, I I know this is the strange thing in, in the land of Durga. Our attitude towards women is both of worship on one level and complete ideas and denigration on another level. And it's very, very difficult to, to get put together. Um, I often say that what we do a lot is to worship. And the very idea of worship does not permeate down into uh, our lives. Um, if that worship transformed into devotion, and that devotion actually dominated our lives. And I'm not saying that you have to be devotional singing. I mean devotion in in every step that you take and in every breath that you breathe. There is a sense of devotion. Um, and honestly, we need to take away devotion from its disciplinary, if you like, context. It's 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 a way of life. Uh, if you can bring that down into a devotional basis, then that would we would not be able to just 
say, you know, transform Durga into something that we have on a mantle piece in a picture and five minutes a day we worship or that we do a big festival every other day. Uh, that's one uh, answer I have and that's what goes wrong. The other thing is that we misunderstand our myths. We mi misinterpret our myths because um, a lot of our mythology is between uh, these very, very strong female uh, goddesses are talking about the feminine and not necessarily the female and the masculine and not necessarily the man. And we miss that point. Sometimes, often, we just miss that point. Uh, they are the feminine of the universe and the masculine of the universe in conflict with the, each other cre are, uh, are create, you know, becomes the creative universe. The idea of the birth and death and birth and death and of the universe. So some, often we miss the points beyond mythology, in mythology. And because we don't quite study it, it or even in, in devotion of it, it becomes easier to consign to a picture on the wall or a five day festival. So that's what I believe in, in a very small way uh, to your second question. The, to your first question, uh, the point that you raised is somewhere, um, when we tell the story uh, of, let's say you're talking about the flawed hero and the flaws in the hero. Um, all stories are about if there was no flaw, and I'm not saying that you know a man has to be an alcoholic or a man has to be a drug abuse or a man has to be a murderer, but I will say in general, the journey of say the hero, uh, or and I'm saying the hero could be a woman or a man, the journey is there is a journey, and the flaws in that journey accentuated as they might be at certain time, are what bring us closer to those characters because we, they reflect the flaws within us. If there was a flawless human being on screen, we have no point, touch point with that because we don't relate to us because we know we're not flawless. We know we're not flawless. So in a way, flaws are very essential to the hero's journey. But if what I suspect what you're saying is that in the end, where do you land up? Where does the hero land up? I mean, are we making moral, are we, are we telling moral stories and be saying in the moral story at the end, uh, the, the flaw that, the, uh, that you're talking about in the hero's journey lands up as a flaw that we applaud, then of course it's wrong. Then it, of course it shouldn't be done. Um, but uh, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a much larger question than you have been portraying it that, um, there would be a, there would not be a story till there is a flaw in your character, and it is the flaws in the character that define the journey of the character. Yeah. Yes. 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 Uh, uh, Shekhar ji. Yeah. Uh, you once mentioned in a talk that you know uh, whenever you're trying to portray a character on screen or something, you like to go into a mode of panic. And from that, uh, you know, that brings you closer to the, uh, when you were telling me about the flaws and where it leads to, you know, that came up to my mind, uh, good to show that flaws of a character. And it is true. In fact, it brings closer, brings it closer to the masses. And at the end, the truth should be, you know, if the truth comes out, it's much better than reflect and introspect and move ahead. Uh, is that probably something missing? Again, you've asked me to do a question. When you say panic, it was a different thing. I said that when I, uh, at one point we plan everything that we do, we have great, huge plans. Uh, but the plan, let's say if I'm going out to film on that day, uh, for all the plans that I make that moment that I'm actually about to say, start camera, that moment I've never seen. So what is that moment telling me? And so, I do create a sense of panic in myself so that my mind that is addicted to a planning, it's an ego also, that is addicted to planning. I panic my mind into a state of confusion that it no longer knows, and it no longer knows what it had planned. In that moment, I'm hoping that the moment will re reveal itself. So what is that moment when an artist puts a, you know, you're looking at a blank canvas and you've got your brush, 
Um, and you have an idea and a painting in mind, but that moment when you take your brush and just make the first stroke on a blank canvas, uh, you are hoping that somewhere, the moment in itself, now you can describe it in any way. You can say faith, you can say God, you can say the moment, you can say, we all have a million ways to describe that moment of the brush first coming across, you know, that first brush stroke against a blank canvas. Uh, to me, I have to, I know one thing that I have to put my mind out of the way. I have to put my planning out of the way so that the moment reveals itself to me. And that may be something from the universe, maybe a creative charge from the universe. I, you know, we can, that is like, we can discuss all our lives about what that moment is. It is what we all are craving for, for that moment in many, many ways, all our lives. So that's that moment. I think the other thing that I was talking about was that if I can't find that character inside me, however, you know, however horrible that character might be, if I can't find the rapist inside me, and if I can't find the raped inside me, how am I going to create anything? I think that we are all a potential of everything. We are born with the potential to be everything. So we are also therefore born with the potential of understanding everything and then with the potential of doing good. Uh, so certainly if you ever see Bennett Queen, I was the rapist, but I was also the raped. So I found both characters and both feelings and both, both journeys inside me and therefore I could shoot it. That's why I'm saying that it was uh, an attack about, on myself. If I didn't find the rapist inside me, I could not have made that film. So we are all born, born with the potential of being anything, but then it, that's the beauty of life. We are all born with the potential of being and doing anything, you know, uh, every moment and every emotion that is potentially possible to feel is within us. And we can believe and feel that emotion if we so direct ourselves towards that. And that's the beauty of life. And that's the beauty of life is then how do you find that which you should direct yourself? How do you find the truth of yourself? And my, my feeling is that we find the truth in ourselves is, is love. And so that's why we keep looking for that because that is the ultimate truth behind every potential moment, every potential, uh, every potential act that is ever possible as a human act has that potential inside you. That makes sense. Really, sir. So thank you very much. This was Debashish. Mm -hmm. I'm doing a PhD in application of drones for disaster management here at Tamachi Labs. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Sekarji. Hi. 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 Hi, Sam. How are you? Oh no, this is Kripa. Sorry. Different account. Um I um I have a question for you. Um Bhavani Chichi had mentioned making something about like, like or talking about policy. And I understand your point when you say it's, it's not necessarily fruitful to make regulations and policy. And when we were talking, when you visited in February, um, you had talked about how funding is so much of an issue. Like, um, fun, like funding agencies will not permit certain or they will only support certain types of imagery or messaging and so in that sense where like if 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 people are claiming to be making things for the masses but so much of what is what is finally made public is dependent on funding is there any middle ground that can be made or found met with in terms of like encouraging funding to look at or to encourage the right right kind of messaging or more positive messaging in media? Well, one of the great arts of making cinema is subverting what people think you're making and what you make. You know, so uh, I keep telling my, my assistants that uh, one of the things that you have to learn to do is if you really believe in something, you have to turn it around so that other believe, others believe that you're making what they want, but you're actually making what you want. And uh, we do that a lot, but you know, there is, when I look at it, some of the best cinema coming out 
today from a political point of view is from Iran. You know, and some of the most beautiful films are coming out of Iran and it's so tough, must be so tough to make films in Iran, right? And when I go back and I see some of the great masters that we study were Yugoslavian filmmakers, Czech filmmakers at a time when, and, and Russian films at a time when, you know, they could go and be executed for what they did and somehow they managed to make it. Now, I'm not saying we should go that extreme, but I am saying that I did make Bandit Queen, for example, at a time when nobody would have funded it. Um, when the Indian government would not even have, uh, if they knew what I was making, they would not have allowed it. Because they, they did try and ban the film a lot. Um, you find ways. You find ways to rebel. Uh, that in itself forces your, your, your creativity. But coming back to the larger issue of funding, funding normally relates to uh, distribution. If people are willing to distribute, then you will find funding. So you go the other way and find ways to distribute your films. And today it is both, um, you know, with the OTT platforms and with technology is giving you a million different ways to distribute. There was a time when you had, you know, we only have 9,000. Let's just take India. We have only 9,000 screens in five languages. There's hardly any, uh, uh, on a theatrical was always a difficult thing to find funding because you couldn't find points of distribution. You couldn't get tiers, right? And now there is the, we are we are in a content hungry world, so people are making different different kind of things, and we are soon heading to a technology now where you can make a film, and if you can get enough attention, and the technology is making it cheap to stream your own film soon every. Every filmmaker will find a way to, to not have to go and ask somebody to stream their film and show the film. They'll be able to do it themselves. And so, but it's a double-edged sword. Um, you know, the fact is that when a new form of distribution comes, the first adopters up, uh, uh, the first adoption is born, always is. You know, every watch YouTube, you watch this and everything. The first adoption is born and the first bits of funding come from there. But they're the ones that give, it's so funny, they give rise to the impetus to that platform. Now people are making films on YouTube. People are making educational ideas on, on, on YouTube. So technology is giving the content maker more and more chances of allowing it to disseminate his or her uh, content to people. Um, of course, that's creating uh, uh, such a lot of noise in the market. So how do you find, you know, how do you find people to listen to you? It makes noise. How do you make sure people listen to you? Well, that's part of your craft. That has to become part of your craft. But you certainly have the platforms now, and it's just technologically we are whizzing in, 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 into a point where I could effectively now make a film and very soon make have it streaming with Tao and you know maybe just go to the cloud and find a way to stream my films by using the you know the technology and the um, the all all, all the uh, uh, storage capacity and the stream capacity use a cloud cloud system and do it cloud storage and cloud usage is becoming cheaper every day. So, yeah, technology is allowing you to do that, but it's also creating clutter. And how do you get out of the clutter? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, hello, sir. Am I available? Hi. Uh, thank you, sir, for being here. Uh, my name is Nihal Kaur, and I'm. Uh, uh, ni Nihal, Nihal, can you turn on your uh, uh, your cameras so we can see you, please? I'm sure, sir. Hi, um, so my name is Nihal Kaur and I've recently joined Amrita um, as an E4Life a PhD student and I'm studying uh, social media's impact on rural adolescents' mental health, um, specifically. This is something in a nutshell. So my question to you is that you've been in, in this industry for a very long time, that too as an integral part of it and um, as, as a director. So from the director's point of view, so so there has been this shift that I, that assumable shift in 
of sense of fear amongst the directors and filmmakers uh, that if I portray a character of a female um, who decides to, you know, uh, divorce her male partner because he slapped her, as we saw in Anubhav Sinha's uh, Thappar uh, movie uh, recently. So, so there has been this sense of fear, I assume it. So, do you think that it was there, you, you just mentioned that, uh, about the funding problem also, like if I portray for the Bandit Queen also, you thought that you might not get the funding, will people see it? Because obviously cinema is not just a very, you know, fancy schmancy thing for the elite or for the educated who have been you know, progressive with all these ideas and thoughts. But then it is for everyone. It, it goes for everybody in India, all the places, all the villages as well. So yeah, it's not just limited So for the mass, mass thing. So I wanted to ask about, the, like, was that sense of fear really there? And how do you think that it has shaped with time? Where do you see it, it stands today? That would be my question. Thank you. Well, one of two things you raised is very important. One, that there should be a sense of fear because a sense of fear creates a sense of responsibility. You know, it cannot be casual. So there should be a sense of fear. The other thing, then you go the other way and you then highly dramatize uh, beyond the dramatics of it. You highly dramatize something that you are wanting to say and because you want to make a commercial idea out of it and then you dramatize it so much uh, that it, it loses its, its relatability. It just becomes... Uh, it becomes something that is kind of over the top, right? Uh, so somewhere you have to find the balance, but of course you're afraid. Of course, nowadays you're more afraid. Um, and so you should be. So you should be. You should have that sense of fear to have that sense of responsibility. And I'm glad that you're saying that the filmmakers are, are now facing that sense of fear and that sense of responsibility. I hope they are. And I hope they move forward and yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, and yeah, we go, the pendulum sings the other way too sometimes. Um, but yeah, I, like for example, in the West for, you know, if you're making a film about black people, they are saying that the producers have to be black or if you're making a film about ethnic people, they're going the other way and they're saying, well, if them there is certain ethnicity that you're making a film with, then where is that ethnicity, both in the production, in the directing, and in the cast? Where is that ethnicity? And people are becoming really, really careful about that. Now, yeah, does that mean that I could never, as a, as as an Indian, actually make Elizabeth ever? Now, in this day, I'm not a woman, and I'm not white, and I'm not. I'm from India, and I'm not British. Maybe. It's not a good thing. I, I think that people, I think the pendulum has swung the other way, but there's a great understanding and realization, certainly in world cinema, about, uh, about who you are and why you're doing this, you know? Why you're doing this. And uh, if you're doing it for the wrong reasons, it does get questioned. So from the, in answer to yourself, it's a little confusing, the new world, but it is fear. Confusion causes fear, but it does make you recognize your responsibilities. It's a good thing. Sure, so the connect there, yes. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you. Uh, hello, can I jump in? Yeah. Hi, I'm Anushree. Um, Jay Kali, thank you so much for being here and thank you for the film that you did on Amma. It was wonderful. Um, I couldn't imagine a Hollywood director being here without charging an arm and a leg. So thank you for your generosity in being with us today. And it makes me um, a bit bold to make uh, my first point in question. I have um, two points in questions. The first is when you were talking about um, the hero's journey, I got chills because that was so inspirational for me um, with Joseph Campbell hearing all these stories about how the hero's journey really is about life today and turning life into a myth. And I think that we need to talk about the heroine's journey. And, and you mentioned a couple of things. You talked about India as the land of Durga and that it's easier to worship her on a portrait or in a four day festival, nine day festival, than actually worship the. Um, woman in reality 
And as a PhD fellow here at Emmerich University, that's exactly what I'm talking about in my thesis about how women are revered in spirituality, respect and revered, but in reality, it's totally different. So I got the idea that, well, if you're so generous, perhaps I can be a little bit bold and ask if it would be possible to have a formal interview with you um, in this regard, because I think something like that coming from you in my thesis would really be very relevant, talking about um, really that disconnect between the spirituality and the um, reality of the condition of women. And since you did such a lovely film in Amma, I'm even more encouraged to find a way to um, to uh, include you. If you would be so willing to um, have a formal interview with me, I can um, contact you through Bhavani Cheji, who's my guide. Um, so that's one intervention, and I won't put you on the spot. You can answer later. Um, the next one, that was in my um, capacity as a PhD fellow here. In my personal capacity as a Black woman from the Americas, you've also said some things that really struck chords with me. Um, first of all, the prevailing uh, stereotypes of women in India, you talked about submiss um, submissive or sort of uh, heroine. But even then, the, most women fall into those roles. They either see themselves as sort of the housewife or sort of the um, other type who's independent and strong and whatnot. But what about the women who don't fit into either of those categories? And you've touched on it. You touched on the Black women. You've mentioned um, women as mothers, which I think falls into that stereotype because they're the women who aren't the mothers, who still want to see themselves in a positive role and not the role as the devil wears Prada, but a woman who's professional, but still a woman, still has her femininity and she's not being this hardcore man in a woman's body. So what happens to those women who, even, even though there are limited stereotypes of women in cinema, there's still, most women still sort of fit into somewhere in those roles, but that there are women who totally don't fit in at all. And so where do those stories get told? And you mentioned that um, the issue of black cinema that you need to be a black director to sort of nowadays tell a black story. I've always hated that growing up that you, there's either like, I go see a white movie with my white friends or I go see a black movie with my black friends and there's no like normal mixed movie like where there's black people and white people and it's not stereotypical and it's just normal every day. It's not caricatures because that what se that's what seems to happen with black movies. And even the black directors do it. They create characters, caricatures of black people. They're not just normal everyday people. So as just in my personal capacity, I wonder why people aren't bold enough to tell those stories about the other types of women. They tell the, the, the you know, at the stories about the stereotypical women, but there's so many women outside of that stereotypical role whose stories never get told. So that was, those were my two interventions and I look forward to your response. And I thank you again for being here with us. Yeah, and I, I um, thank you. Um, of course we should be telling stories about non-stereotypical women. And I agree that uh, the woman's role as a mother is becomes often becomes a stereotype. I mean, you, okay, you've become a mother, so you've completed yourself. No, you haven't. You know, there are many other ways it, to complete yourself. Otherwise, there wouldn't be that many conflicts in this world between relationships if just the, the mother create, becoming a mother is the resolution to every conflict. It's not. It's a personal choice. It's a choice of everyone to be a mother or not to be a mother. And beyond being a mother, there's a vast universe to explore for every woman. There has to be. If that didn't exist, then, then it would be so stereotypical. I think also when you say that um, there is something about film, there's less of the, it, it, we call it drama for a reason. Um, you could take it into being melodramatic, into it being mythic. And we use mytho mythic ideas a lot to tell our stories. 
And therefore, when you say that we, we should make more stories, but just people, ordinary people, yes, we should, except that the nature of storytelling is, is, in, in, is enclosed in an idea called drama. And so there is an accentuation of, of normalcy that creates drama, and therefore you can't actually run away from that. It'll always be an accentuate of something, even if it's normal people in abnormal events. You, you, mirror, uh, you mirror the story of normal people also, also faced by abnormal events, and how do they respond to that? Everyday normal people. So you'll see a lot of content films and television, we're perfectly normal people and they come across, and that's how we find ourselves. That's how we mirror ourselves. Now, what is an abnormal event, you know, to us? Being born is a mythic event, you know. Falling in love is a mythic event. Um, being betrayed is a mythic event. Dying is a mythic event. Our, our lives are full of mythology. So sometimes filmmakers will just take what we consider ordinary and make it extraordinary. And then make uh, re then you as a character reflected off the extraordinary is how we examine people, you know, how we examine characters, how we examine being human is being reflected mm -hmm. off something that we make extraordinary. I mean, exactly. being That's human the is hero's journey. sorry. So, no, I was just agreeing with you that that is the hero's journey. It's just an ordinary event made to appear magical and mystical but it's yeah. only done that way because at the end you show the lesson from this normal experience isn't it yeah and more than a lesson it's an understanding of ourselves and hopefully through the understanding of the response and reactions from the character that you're looking at is uh provoking in a response from you as an audience how do you relate your life to that event? And your responses can, can be completely different. But as long as there is an emotional response from you, because your life is different from that characters, those characters that are portrayed on screen. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So, Namaskar, uh, Shikharji, my name is... Nandita, and I really enjoyed uh, your wisdom. So it was like a, a cinema movie for me to sit and listen to your answers. Um, I would like to come back um, to the opening of you in which you addressed the, the gender gap and in which you also addressed how can we accelerate the, the change in, in the gender profiles. And uh, I... I am, as a, I am a mother, I have a daughter, she's eight years old. And uh, of course I cannot avoid her in, in this time for her to have access to, to media, to mass media. So it's just not possible. I tried my best, but uh, I, I failed in that sense. Uh, she's watching um, cartoons or documentaries and so forth, even right now while I'm sitting here and having this meeting with you. But I'm, um, I have to monitor her very closely because I also recognize that she, uh, of course, due to her age also, she um, tends also to identify with characters which are produced and, and created by, um, by artists, so as you said. And I see ideally, um, and I would totally agree with your comment, as when you said, uh, when I create a, a movie or a film, I'm the creator and uh, me and my creation are somehow, um, should go hand in hand, they should be... Uh, synchronized and that's the ideal case and I was always first of all as a scientist and secondly also as a mother uh, where I'm always interested in how can we can we raise uh, consciousness and filmmakers are part of, of society so we are sitting a few so on and you mentioned it also in the same boat so we have filmmakers we have scientists we have workers and so forth and everybody has its own responsibility so saying that um, the film industry does x y is also in my point of view not right because uh, they're also part of the industry and i'm also uh, sorry not industry society i'm also part of it so there's a lot of self-responsibility and um we are when we coming back to the film industry we 
observe a lot of multi-optional uh, consumption offers in, in profiles for women, for men, for heroes, for, for anti-heroes and so forth. And um, coming back to my daughter, I uh, want to avoid, of course, that she's identifying herself with any of these characters. And coming down to a very practical um, um, and tangible thing in our daily lives is uh, one, of, one of the things that I'm, I'm, I'm talking with her about, that it is a creation of a person. I show her, for example, um, how films are going to be uh, made and how people are sitting there in the first step, having an idea, writing it down, making a film out of it, so that she really can see that there's something created by men and, and women. And um, secondly, I uh, also encourage her, and she's very annoyed of that, but I'm still remembering her, like, uh, every every 20 minutes oh you're watching a movie or oh, that's a film oh it's made by this and that uh, person or it's it's uh, man-made and uh, to to make her aware that she's watching something which is not uh, which not consumes her um, totally so I feel that uh, the change and as you said I would totally agree needs to come from all of us first of all that we are conscious while we are watching and secondly, that we are also um, uh, seeing our own responsibility uh, with self-reflection. So if I'm identified with a, with, a, with a profile created by one person um, as a part of society, then I am, uh, I'm also a creator of that. I'm also a creator of the gender gap. And we as scientists, I feel also we have, we, maybe we need to work um, hand in hand together to really, it's not just the film industry, it's, it's all of us to make a change to make, uh, bring more light and awareness and also competency in, uh, in, in the consumption of, of movies. And in the lockdown, especially in the lockdown, when we are overflowed with the opportunity to watch Netflix or to watch this and that and the different, you, you mentioned also another platform. Um, um, and, and this being aware of, uh, that's just one part, just one creation uh, of the society is I feel in everybody's responsibility. And it's not just that the film industry creates this profile and the profile is not representative and so forth. It's really, uh, we need to be aware that's just an offer. It's a, it's a, it's a piece of, of uh, creation. It's a piece of art. And uh, we need to, I feel, empower ourselves as scientists, as educators, as mothers, and how you're doing it here right now in that moment, to see media as it is, not more and not less. It has its part as science has, but to be able to deal with it and not get overwhelmed and, and eaten by, by uh, these um, man-made creations. What field of science are you in? I'm a social scientist and uh, yeah, I um, studied uh, psychology and educational sciences with uh, sociology and I did my PhD especially um, in the science of compassion. So no, no. I was uh, a big fan of your documentary really. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. When my daughter was very young, four, five, she started, if, you, if I gave her a set of crayons, she would draw, instinctively draw. And I would watch, and I saw that in those drawings, she encompassed, there was no censorship of that drawing. And because there was no censorship, there was a sense of joy, wonderment, curiosity in every stroke of drawing. Now, whether she drew on a piece of paper or on the walls, or whether she took a pair of scissors and cut the curtains, and all of that. I thought that she had a great ability to express herself through her drawings. And so when she joined school, came back, we were in London, came back to India, and I said, I have to send her to art class. And I sent her to art class, and she came back and said, look, Dad, what I've done. And she had created a, a house and a tree and a chimney and smoke coming out. And I thought, I've just, through trying to teach, I just destroyed a sense of joy and a sense of discovery, right? It was a big lesson for me. It was a lesson for me that the more we, so you, you said it right, it is not just, it is education and cinema and it's everything else. We teach our children to look upon the world 
with greater and greater definition confining things to define by defining things to confining things where I feel that they're born with an ability to look beyond definition. You know, they, they are born with an ability and we, uh, beyond definition and more as everything could have 10 answers. It's neither yes nor no. It's neither this nor that. It could be this, it could be that. And I think they're born with that. And our system of education is constantly drumming into everybody that ultimately you need to look upon this world as something defined. Now, let me yeah, tell you exactly. why I'm saying this. So now when they look at anything in YouTube, for example, we worry that they will see it as a defined world. That's what concerns yes. us. Right? And identify with it. Yeah, they identify yeah. with it. But if we hadn't taught, to taught them to be able to, to look at everything as defined and identify, they would be, that's only less than 1% of the world that they're responding to. So when a child walks through nature, as a child, they're responding to everything. You know, um, they are, uh, we haven't, so let me come back, uh, I'll talk about nature next. Uh, let me come back to this idea that maybe our concern is that we ourselves have created in our kids a sense of that which is not definable does not exist. And if that doesn't, if it doesn't exist, then what the child is watching and identifying with is becoming compulsive. And it's becoming compulsive because we've taken away the ability of the child to say everything else exists at the same time. Right? And I think that maybe there's a larger, ad because we're not going to be able to stop it. We're not going to be able to stop the imagination and we're not going to be able to stop and play rules and, that with the imagination, people will try and capture the imagination of the child and make money out of it. But what we can help them to see is that their imagination of what they see is just one part of something that is much larger and, and huge. And maybe that's where we should be going in our education also. So when everybody comes to me and said, Shega, why don't you start a school of filmmaking or school of creativity? I keep saying, why can't I start a film, a school of unlearning? You know, maybe as adults, we have trained ourselves to learn rather than to explore. Um, and a lot of problems in our society becomes, I mean, even if you're talking about gender issues, the more we define gender issues, the more issues we have with gender issues. Because we have a habit of trying to define everything. Right? And because if it, we don't define it, we don't exist. Who, are, who am I if I cannot define myself? Well, the issue is, why am I confining myself by defining myself? And because I have a million thoughts and therefore a million identities going through my mind all the time. Which one am I? If I define myself, I'm becoming tribal. And I'm, then I'm inculcating a sense of fear because I've ignored everything else that I am. This is a complex question. I'm sure you as a social scientist, and because you're with Amma, these are obviously things that have occurred to you. Otherwise, you wouldn't be there. Right? And um, so maybe that's what we need to do with our children, is to keep them children. And maybe that's what we need to do with ourselves, is to keep ourselves children. Yeah. yeah? That's what I think. It's a very complex question you've asked, and everybody's wondering right now how to handle that. And you're right to say that the responsibility to, to not counter that, we're not going to be able to counter that, but the ability of a, a child's mind to be able to play, play rather than define. Yes, just be free rather than identification and thinking that yeah. it is the right way to be. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> unfortunately, for us, maybe not for you, um, we, uh, we have to end. You've been, in the very beginning, I said thank you for your generosity, uh, for coming and taking time to speak with us. Um, and thank you for all the things that you have to say, really. And I'm going to take advantage of the fact that I'm the last one, and I'll just make a couple of quick comments. 
uh, and they'll be inadequate just because uh, there's much more behind what it is I'm about to say. But something to think about. So when there was a suggestion that we can mandate or give uh, uh, some legislation, something like that, about how to behave, um, <clears throat> and you said something which is correct, and I'll add a little bit, people already are opposed to it from the very beginning. The moment that you have something like that, your first response, certainly in Israel, is, uh, you know, who are you to tell me? And now you're going to try and find ways to get around it, or you just ignore it. And that happens often. On the other hand, in the EU, a number of years ago, there was legislation passed that every EU committee has to have at least 50% women. And in the beginning, there was grumbling and grousing. And now, many years later, nobody even thinks about it. Everybody thinks that's what always was. And so the way of using legislation for certain kinds of activity that could lead to, in this case, more representation of women in uh, councils uh, having to do with the EU. So that's number one. Number two, I noticed that we were talking a lot about women and motherhood. And somehow men and fatherhood slipped uh, under the radar. Mm. And that's something which uh, I think all of us should pay attention to. And there are all kinds of social reasons why that's the case now. But just to remind everybody, uh, there are fathers and they do have roles important roles in, uh, in uh, family life, of course, and in child rearing. The last thing is, um, I'm, I'm not gonna distill all of what you said, obviously, but much of what you said has to do with, in terms of your filmmaking and in terms of <clears throat> uh, who we are, and that is, uh, firing people's imagination, not only about what is, but also about what could be. Not what should be, but sometimes people go over the border and they go from could be to should be. But here's something to think about. Let's look at it. And sometimes it's done with humor. In film, I remember a long time ago, I don't remember the name of the film, with Jack Lemmon and Marilyn Monroe, and he was, uh, dressed as a woman and then it was the beginning of an idea of transgender even though it was done with the humor in the way that it was done or homosexuality and films exist now um <clears throat> lesbian all the me too things as well and these are telling it's giving it a, a sense of possibility not only what exists mm -hmm. and what exists has the magic, but also yeah. the possibility. This could be, this is a way to think about a world. Um, and sometimes it's, and it's often uncomfortable for uh, people. Uh, it depends on how it is that you present it, as I said. Okay. Well, those are a few comments. And <clears throat> what I would like to do is thank you for a particularly illuminating uh, talk, discussion, your responses. And they showed me at least how a, a wisdom gained from understanding life and not understanding life and seeking understanding and understanding that within each and every one of us is a godliness. Each and every one of us has the flaws. Each and every one of us um, seeks love in different ways and don't always succeed. But this is part of all of us. This is what we are born with. 
And the way that you spoke about uh, film and art and human beings and the problems we all have and the joys we all have indicates, uh, uh, to me at least, that your film is not just the film, the technical part, but it's the ideas behind them, of course, and the grappling with uh, who you are and how you present yourself uh, with your own insecurities and with your own misunderstandings or non-understandings. That was really remarkable, what you had to say. And I'm really moved by it all. Thank you. Yeah. I, I wasn't asked to represent everybody, but I'll bet you anything that most of the people, uh, if they're not nodding their heads now, they're nodding their heads inside about what it was that uh, uh, we were given, the gift that you gave all of us. And for that, you have my, and I'm sure everybody's, deepest gratitude. Well, thank you for letting me express myself. That's so beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for being here. Uh, see if you, if you dial the screen, you will see all of us on video. We've all turned our videos on. To, yeah. So you can see all the faces behind who've been watching and listening to you. Wow. So many of you. Wow. <laughs> oh, thank you so I much. Maybe know this if I do know you. Okay. Thank you, sir. It's a session of wisdom. Thank you so much. Thank you. We hope you'll come again. <laughs> That's really wonderful. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you.